We're in Genesis chapter number 34 tonight. Of course, this is going to be where Jacob finally returns back to the promised land. Now, he had left the promised land, which is right now the land of the Canaanites, immediately after he had supplanted his brother Esau for his birthright. So he fled from his brother Esau. He went into the land of Nahor, also known as Haran, and he served his father-in-law, or I'm sorry, his, uh, his uncle, Laban. He served his uncle Laban, which ended up being his father-in-law, of course. His father-in-law and his uncle Laban, I was thinking right when he arrived, uh, Laban for 20 years. He left Nahor or Haran. We saw the confrontation that took place with, with Laban and Jacob. And then, of course, we saw the meeting of Esau when he finally got to see his brother after 20 years, after he had uh, deceived him and supplanted him for the birthright. And, uh, and that whole scenario, which was a very big deal in Jacob's life. So he has now arrived back in the promised land and he has rested in the land, which is referred to in the previous chapter of Shechem. And we're going to see why here in Genesis chapter number 34. Just a couple of things that I'm going to uh, be preaching on just to give you a heads up or a summary of what we're going to be looking at here is major, one major thing is the consequences of fornication. The consequences of of fornication. Now we've seen a lot of other sins that have taken place already in the book of Genesis. We've seen the consequences of drunkenness. We saw what a fool and an idiot Noah looked like when he got drunk and he's naked and he just makes you know a shame of himself, right? Then we saw the consequences on a nation that accepts sodomy or accepts homosexuality. What did God do? He, of course, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. We've seen the consequences of adultery, didn't we? We've seen that in a few different examples of polygamy and then just adultery in general. Uh, the situation with uh, Jacob where, he, or I'm sorry, Abraham where his wife almost committed adultery by consent when he gave her unto Abimelech. So we've seen all different sorts of sins and, and issues and the problems that they bring in life. That's one thing that I want to be a major theme in this chapter is every time we see these sins come up and occur, do you know what, you, what occurs in that same chapter as well following it? The punishments, the consequences, the problems that come with sin. And that's what we're going to see here are the consequences of fornication. Just a quick definition because I'm going to be using that word throughout this chapter very much. Uh, fornication is the act wherein two unmarried people will go to bed together. Two unmarried people uh, will have a relationship that should only take place between a husband and a wife. That is what fornication is. That's what we're going to be reading about here in this chapter. Look here in verse number 1. We're going to get right into it. The Bible says this, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, <coughs> excuse me, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Now, Dinah is the only daughter that Jacob has. At this time, of course, Jacob has, he's, he's, his name has been changed to Israel. Jacob has 11 sons, so 11 of the 12 sons that are going to start the 12 tribes, right? But... He also had one daughter, and her name was Dinah. We see the root of the problem really taking place here in just the first couple of verses. Really the first verse. It tells you this in verse number one, one more time. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, it says this, went out to see the daughters of the land. Let me ask you this question, what land? What land is he in right now? Of course, this is going to be the promised land. It is the promised land. They haven't inhabited it yet. What land? Canaan. The land of Canaan. Now, if you remember right, why did Jacob leave in the first place? What was the real reason why he left? Because his mother, his mother said, Hey, you know, I, you know I'm going I'm to die, basically, if you marry one of the daughters of Canaan, right? She said she would rather die the way that she worded it, right? if you marry one of the daughters of Canaan. So are these good people or bad people? They're bad people. Of course, the reason why they end up inhabiting this land is because of their great iniquity, God says. God tells the nation of Israel when He brings them into the land and He tells them to kill all the nations that are there. He tells them, you're possessing this land. He really says for two reasons, over and over and over again, He says it's because of the promise that I gave to your fathers. But specifically this land, 
because of the wickedness of this people. He said, don't think it's for your righteousness personally. It's really for the wickedness of this people. Am I dispossessing the land from them? So we know that the people of Canaan were extremely wicked people. And that makes perfect sense when we see Rebecca talking about her son Jacob, hey, flee into the land where Laban lives. Flee into the land where my family is and, and please marry, marry someone from there because I'd rather die than you marry one of the women of, of Canaan. Why? Because they're extremely wicked. Now, you think it's a smart idea just to let your daughter in the first place go out and see the daughters of the land? You think it's a smart idea just to just send your daughters out, just, just, just unfettered access to the world? You have no idea where she's at? Hey, maybe just give her a cell phone. Does anybody think that that's a smart idea? No, it's a very stupid idea. It's very dumb. Now, let me ask you this question. How old? How old is Dinah right now? Have you ever thought about that? How long was Jacob in uh, the land with, of Nahor and Haran? How long? 20 years. So, is she 20? No. She was, the, she was the seventh born. It was after the six sons, then Dinah. Okay? So, at the most, Dinah is like 18, 17, 18. More realistically, if you break the time up, she's probably about 15 or 16 years old. Now, do you think it's... Let me re-ask the question, and, 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 and I want you to even reconsider. Obviously, it was a no already, but do you think it'd be smart to take a 15-year-old daughter and just send her out into a foreign country, a foreign land that you know wicked people dwell in and say, hey, go see the daughters of the land. You think that that's a smart idea? That's a very, very foolish, stupid idea. Now, I want you to turn uh, to Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Deuteronomy chapter number 22. We're going to be coming here twice tonight. While, <clears throat> while a daughter is living in her home with her father, it is her father's job to, to maintain her purity. It is her father's job to make, sh make sure that she stays pure and clean and a virgin. <clears throat> I want you to go, as I said, to Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Let me get there myself. I'm going to show you this and, and see that it is, it is uh, <coughs> primarily the father but also the mother. Also the mother is, of course, responsible for this. Now, I realize in our day and age that fornication may not be a big deal. But here's the thing. Understand this. I don't give a rip what the world thinks. They can be as filthy and as disgusting and as sleazy as they want to be. I care what that God thinks. Okay? I don't care how disgusting the world gets. Because, hey, cultures go down the tube. People go down the tube. You know, nations in general, they start off oftentimes, as our nation did, you know, uh, on Christian principles in, in a big way, right? But you know what happened was... It, our, our nation today, our nation today is not a Christian nation as far as the people. Now, when I say a Christian nation in the first place, like in the past, I'm not referring to the, to the founders. Now, you may be ignorant of this, but our founders were not Christian men. George Washington was not a Christian man. He was a theist. He did not believe in the New Testament as in he put his faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were theists and they, they respected the principles of the Old Testament and things along that line. And they believed in a creator, but they were not Christian. The people of the country were in masses Christian. They, were, they had Christian principles. Now, if that is what I consider to be a Christian nation, when I use those terms, that we were a Christian nation, that's what I mean when I say that, we're no longer a Christian nation today. Now, that may offend you, but I don't care. We're not a Christian nation. You look around at the majority of the people in the United States today, they're not Christian. They're not true, they're not truly saved, and they're not following uh, the Bible and the principles of the Bible. And fornication has just become acceptable today. Just where, you know, somebody's daughter, uh, you know, the man of the house, the, the, the father will have his daughter come home and he'll find out that his daughter is knocked up or his daughter is going to be having a child and it's not that big of a deal. He's just like, oh, all your friends are too. Oh, this is just what, you know, you know, you're, you know your, your mother got pregnant at a, at a young age too. That doesn't make it okay. Right. You know, your mother was doing the same thing. That doesn't make it all right. I don't care how acceptable something is. Right. Fornication is extremely wicked. Amen. It's extremely sinful. So it doesn't matter whether the world accepts it or not. It doesn't matter whether it becomes practiced in the world today and it's just common and whether or not most fathers just don't think it's a big deal. 
You know, you should love your daughter. And one of the major things, one of the most important things about men and women, right, is their purity. Is their purity. I want you to look here in Deuteronomy chapter number 22, verse number 13. The Bible says this. We're not going to get the full context. I just want to teach you a truth that we can learn from this passage. It says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her, and hate her, and give occasions of speech against her, and then it tells you why he hates her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Now, maid there means virgin. So, the reason why he hates her, he, he went unto her, went in unto her, meaning that they had the relationship that a husband and a wife have, right? And then after that says that he hates her, and why? He's disgusted by her, basically. Why? Because he finds out that, he, that she is not a virgin. Now, does this sound like it was a big deal to this person? It sound like it was a big deal at that time? Yeah, it was a huge deal to have a virgin wife, right? Then it says this, verse 14, and give a cage of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. Verse 16, and the damsel's father so notice he's the head of the household. He's speaking on behalf of his daughter. Shall say unto the elder, elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her, and lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. So this is in the case if the man was lying. So they're bringing proof to say that she was a virgin, and now they're taking it to the elders, which are the judges, and he's saying, this man's lying. He's saying that my wife, or my daughter, I'm sorry, was not a virgin. His wife. Look at what it says next. And gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. Verse 19, and they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver. So the, the, man, the, the man that lied about his daughter, he's supposed to pay the father. And give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. I want you to notice the big deal about claiming or, use, or, or making this false accusation against a damsel or a maid or a what? A virgin of Israel. Notice the punishment. Because he hath brought up an evil name. Notice how the reputation of being a virgin is very important. What happens? Immerse him in a hundred shekels. You want to lie about his daughter and say she wasn't a virgin? Now you have to pay that man a hundred shekels. Uh, keep reading there. Verse number 20, it says this. I want to show you something else. <clears throat> also, I, I didn't point out the fact that the man was chastised. He was beaten for lying about that as well. So notice what a big deal it was also there. Look at ver verse 20. But if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel... Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. Now let me point out something so you don't misunderstand the passage. <clears throat> She's not just being stoned or killed for fornication. She's being stoned or killed because she lied to her father. Do you understand what's going on there? She wasn't just, you know, just being stoned or killed because she admitted, hey, I committed fornication and this is what I did and then they took her and then they stoned her. No, the purpose, the point of this is that she's been going behind her father's back and saying that she was a virgin and saying that she was pure and clean and then lied to her father and allowed her father to give her to another man and then she went and had intercourse with that man and then it was found out that she was not a virgin. So what she was doing was, like it says here, she was playing the whore. She was playing what would also be called a harlot, right? Now I realize a lot of pastors don't want to say that. But you know what the Bible says that a woman that's going around and that's sleeping around and hiding it from her father and going around and just choosing out all these men, you know what the Bible says she is? says she's a whore. Amen. And if that offends you, then the Bible offends you because that's what she is. Right. She's sleazy and she's a whore. That's what, it, that's what she is. Now, the reason why she's put to death is because of the deceit and on top of that, the fornication. It's these two things together 
It's not just the fornication alone, because we're going to look at it here a little bit. The punishment for fornication is not to be put to death. But if a daughter were to lie to her father and then go through with the marriage and then go in and, and, and sleep with that man, then she's to be put to death. And you say, why is that a big deal? Because you don't know how many men she's been with and you don't know what she's done. And this whore could have went out and picked up a bunch of diseases and had hundreds of partners. And then this pure man that's trying to serve God thought that he was getting a virgin and he's getting this disgusting woman who's a liar and a slut. Think about that. Amen. That's what's going on in this type of situation here. So it's not just, you know, oh, he, you know, she committed fornication. That's not what's going on here. It's on top of it, the deceit. And that's not a small little lie. That's a major, major lie. Yeah, I'm clean. Yeah, I'm totally clean. I've never been with anybody before. And then you find out she's, she's been whoring around her entire life since she was a teenager. And one of the reasons why people would be greatly offended by this type of preaching is because fornication, people have become numb to fornication. They don't think it's a big deal. Well, hey, it's a big deal here. It's a big deal when it comes to the Bible. It's a big deal when it comes to God's perception of right and wrong. Fornication is a major, major sin. It's a major sin. One of the, the whole reason we turned here, though, the overall picture, not only to see how wicked and how bad fornication is, Number two, it was to see that it is the father's job. It is the father's job to guard his daughter's purity. It is the father's job. Notice his fa the father has to go and he's the one that speaks on behalf of his daughter. He's the one that comes and has to answer for his daughter's purity. And how shameful and how embarrassing would the father, would the father be if his daughter did lie about it? And then all of this ended up, its outcome where she ends up being stoned to death and she was lying behind his back and going around and being a whore. How shameful would it be? So you know what? You need to not let your daughter out of your sight. You need to not allow your daughter in a situation to where it's even possible she could be you know, committing such an act. You need to be guarding your daughters. Now... Here's the thing. Men and women are different. Boys and girls are different. Uh, if you don't understand that, then you either just have daughters or you just have sons. Because I have both, and they are entirely different. They are entirely in so many different ways. And when you, when you start to, to, to see and to realize all of these differences, and you get all this garbage out of your mind about, oh, we're all the same, you know what it, you know what it pushes you and makes you want to do? It makes you want to protect your daughters more. Because you know what the Bible says that they are the weaker vessel. It talks about your wife being the weaker vessel. You know what I do? My wife doesn't protect me. I protect her. That's right. My wife doesn't, you know, if somebody breaks into my house, you know, I'm not going to be lying in the bed while my wife runs to the door, right? I'm going to be getting up and running to the door. Yeah, that actually happened one time. So, you know, they didn't break into our house, but I had to run to the door. It was a false alarm, right? Everybody knows. But, uh, so here's the thing, you know, I, just like I'm protecting my wife, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to protect my daughter. I'm going to make sure that my daughter keeps her purity. I'm going to make sure that my daughter, when she's handed over to a man, that I can guarantee that she, hey, there, there, there's no question in my mind because she went, never went out and saw the daughters of the land. You know, I never gave her the opportunity to go out and to see the daughters of the land. And all these people say, hey, you know, you are, don't you think that you're sheltering your daughter? Hey, you know what a shelter's for, you moron? A shelter's for what? When there's a tornado, you know what you do? You go in a shelter. It's for protection. So I'm not even opposed to that language. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shelter my daughter. Amen. I'm going to keep my daughter protected. I'm going to make sure that my daughter stays protected. Amen. And here's the thing. You know, uh, today, even more than ever, you need to be looking out for your daughters. You need to be looking out and watching out for, you know, uh, your wife and your daughters. Because, you know, obviously the world is going to uh, hell in a handbasket. Right. So men need to step up to the plate and stop being a bunch of effeminate sissies and start being the man and the leader of their household yeah. and protecting the women in their life. Right. Protecting their daughters and protecting their wife. Go back to uh, Genesis chapter number 34. So we see that it's the father's responsibility to maintain and to make sure that the daughter, that his daughter is pure, that his daughter is chaste or a virgin, right? So what was, well, how did all this come about? Well, you, we can see the, the mistakes that, that Jacob makes. Why? 
They go to a foreign land, a land where there's a bunch of wicked people, and what does he do? He just lets his daughter roam free. Lets his daughter go out there, and when she says that she goes out, it says to see the daughters of the land. Look at what happens in verse number 2. This is the types of situations that occur when you allow your daughter just to go out and see uh, the daughters of the land. It says in verse 2, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, <clears throat> it says he took her and lay with her, and I want you to notice what it says next, and defiled her. That's what's taking place there. Defiled her. Now, of course, I've already announced that this is fornication. Obviously, there are some that hold to uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, interpretation that it's rape. And I'm going to show you why it's not rape, and I'm going to show you a few different reasons why in this chapter, and then comparing Scripture with Scripture, that I believe it's clearly fornication. That's why I've been preaching it from that perspective. Look at verse number 3 now. It says this, And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And it says, And he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. Verse number 4, <coughs> And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. Now, I've pointed this out a few other times, and uh, many of you are probably familiar with this false doctrine, but it's people that will say, it's, a, it's, it's so weird and bizarre. People will teach and say that the Bible says that if you, if, as soon as you uh, uh, go to bed with someone, they become your wife, right? I've showed already a couple other examples where that proves that that's not the case, and this is one as well, because what happened here? They went to bed together, and then he goes to his father and said, get me her to what? Wife saying she's not his wife. So that further proves that it's not his wife yet. So what is this that took place? It's fornication. Look at verse number 5. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. So that's saying that he held his peace as in he didn't talk about it. He didn't tell his sons what had happened. It's, it's Talk about his son's coming. Why, and right here it kind of backs up. Look at verse 6. And Hamor the father of Shechem went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And then verse 7, if you put the whole story together, how this actually occurred. You see the Jacob and them come up next. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth. How does this seem? Does it seem like it's a big deal to, to them? It's a very big deal, isn't it? It's, it's grievous. It's grievous uh, you know, that someone has committed fornication, especially you find out your, your sister. I mean, that's terrible, right? <clears throat> and also, you know, older brothers, they should be doing the same things. You know, they should be protecting their, their sisters. Older brothers should be protecting their sister's purity and, uh, and, and their cleanliness, right? It says that they were very wroth. It should make you angry. And then it says this, because he had wrought Folly, that means foolishness. He had wrought folly in Israel <clears throat> in lying with Jacob's daughter. Which thing ought not to be done? Notice those words. Which thing ought not to be done? <clears throat> One point that I, I want to kind of put in your mind to help you understand the whole picture and what's going on here is, is if you would have noticed, uh, his father was a prominent figure. It said in verse 2, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, it says he took her and lay with her, and defiled her. And then he went to his father and said, verse 4, And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. So notice you can see kind of this, this, uh, this kind of spoiled attitude where he's just like, Hey, get me this, get me this woman to wife, right? Because he has this position of authority as well, just being uh, related to his father, who is the king or the prince. He's ruling over all of these people, right? So of course he has kind of this, uh, this, this spoiled attitude. Not only that, I want to focus here on verse 7. Notice the strong language about fornication. We're going to look at what, what God thinks about this sin and how bad this sin actually is. Verse number 7 again. We're going to read it one more time. We're going to compare Scripture to Scripture a couple other verses. So look at verse 7. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. It's talking about that his, 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 uh, their sister uh, had committed fornication with another man, right? With a man. It says this, And they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Obviously, if you still have your bulletin, uh, you can throw that in Genesis 34. We're obviously going to keep going back to Genesis 34. That's our text <coughs> for tonight. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. I want to show you how serious uh, fornication is. And it's not just... Uh, something that <coughs> was taken serious in the Old Testament. 
It's taken serious in the New Testament. God does not change. Culture changes. People change. You know what they do? Most of the time they degrade, like I was mentioning earlier. That's what happens. The majority of the time, that's what happens, sadly. But God does not change. You know, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. God's Word does not change. Cultures change, God does not change. So if fornication was wrong in the Old Testament, it's wrong in the New. If it was wrong when it was pinned down in the New Testament, it's still wrong today. Nothing changes, my friend. Morality does not change. Right and wrong does not change. You know, killing someone, murdering someone was wrong as soon as man was created, right? It was wrong, you know, obviously before that, but in the sense of what man does and how he lives out his life, <clears throat> it was wrong when, when Cain slew Abel. And murdering someone is still wrong today. Well, fornication was wrong at that time too. And guess what? It's still wrong today. Whether, whether uh, people are doing it or not, it doesn't matter. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. It says this in verse number 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, what does it mean to not... Not company, I'm sorry, not to company with fornicators. What does it mean to n not company? We would say a company, that's why I thought that I said it wrong there. What does it mean to not accompany or not company with someone? What does it mean? <clears throat> not to be around them. So notice verse, just verse 9 alone. We're getting ready to look at another verse. But what does this say in verse number 9? Now this is talking about uh, a, a brethren we're going to see in the very next verse. But what does this verse say right here? Not to be around fornicators. Not to be around fornicators. Now, how bad does, that, does, does something have to be in order not to be around them? Well, we've got to go to the Bible to find that out, right? The reason why I say that is because you probably, for a moment there, might try to make up things in your mind. Well, somebody who's murdering someone or somebody who's doing these types of things, you know, I shouldn't be around those types of people. <clears throat> But the Bible, God's Word says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Somebody that is living in fornication or committing fornication, you shouldn't be around that person. You should tell that person like, hey, I don't want to be around you. I shouldn't be around you. Look at verse 10. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world. Talking about the people that are not saved. He's saying, yeah, I'm not saying everybody who's not saved too. The fornicators of the world too. Not all together, everyone saying of this world. Then he says this, <clears throat> of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, or idolaters, says, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying then you would have to take yourself completely out of the world if you, if you had to just not be around any person that committed these types of acts, saved and unsaved, like people that aren't brethren. Because obviously when you go to work, you know what you're around all the time? Fornicators, idolaters, right? Those people are, you know, most likely, because the, the majority just aren't saved, you're just around a bunch of people that are unsaved fornicators, unsaved idolaters. So he's saying, I'm not saying, you know, just anyone that's unsaved, you're not allowed to be around, right? He said, and then he goes on to say, in verse number uh, 11, But now I have written unto you, <clears throat> not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Now why is he a brother? Because we are fellow sons of God, right? We both have the same Father. We both have the same Father because we're saved, right? Like Brother Hall said there. So what is it saying? It's saying not to keep company if any man that is saved or if any man that is one of your brethren be a fornicator. And then there's another, uh, uh, other things added to the list here. A covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner with such an one no not to eat. But obviously the one we're focus on, uh, focusing on right now is fornication. Now you may think that fornication is not a big deal, but the Bible says it's a very big deal. To the point where you as a Christian should not be around them. You, if, if you have a brother or if you have a, a, another person that is a Christian that you know, you shouldn't be around that person if they're living in fornication. You should go to them and tell them you're not going to be hanging out with them anymore until they get right with God. Until they get out of the, the fornication relationship that they're in. It, it tells you like, oh, how much, you know, how much can I have? It says, and no, not to eat. What's his point? No, not to eat. Saying, he, his point is, not at all. What does it mean to company with someone? It means to have any fellowship with them at all, right? Now, if we read the whole context of, them, of this, do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about somebody in the church of Corinth, in the church or in the congregation of Corinth. And do you know what he's telling them? He's actually telling them to kick the fornicator out of the church. So, fornication is so serious. It's so serious that God says, 
If someone is attending the church and it's found out that they're living in fornication, kick them out of the church. Right. They're not allowed at the church. Right? They're not allowed to attend the church. That is what the Bible teaches. So if you're trying to figure out how, ser how serious is fornication, how does God feel about it? Well, God preaches and teaches all throughout the New Testament through epistles and all different types of ways the importance of coming to church. It's super important to be in church. But guess what? If you're living in fornication, He says, I don't want you in the church. That's what God is saying. If He's saying, kick them out of the church, He's saying, I don't want you in the church. Now, a lot of churches don't practice church discipline. That's a lot of churches other than Valley Baptist Church. Because if somebody has found out that they're living in fornication, we'll kick them out of the church. I will personally, as the overseer and the ruler, kick them out of the church. You will not be, not be allowed to come here. Now, that is not only, it's not people think, oh, it's because you hate us. No, or you hate me, or whatever it may be. No, uh, it's not because we hate you, it's because we love you. It's because we want you to get right with God. And not only that, we love the people in the church. And the Bible teaches in this, in this particular chapter, right before this, it says, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about that person living in fornication. Saying that that filth and that sin will spread to the entire church. That sin will spread to everyone else in the church. That's the reason why you're supposed to get them out of the church. Now, if somebody's living in a grievous sin, what's the best thing for them? What do they need to do? Get right with God, right? They need to repent. Now, are they going to repent if they never have to face any consequences? Most people? No. They're not going to, right? They're not going That's just the majority of people. So that's also another reason why. You know what? It helps the person get right with God. You know what happens when he writes his second letter to the church at Corinth? That person got right with God. Right. So if you say, oh, I think that's mean. I think you're hateful for throwing people out of the church. Paul, when he did it, let's look at an example. Let's look at an example to follow. Paul, number one, Paul's my authority. The Bible's my authority. That's why I would do it. But Paul said to do it. Paul did it. The church of Corinth did it by Paul's command. And when they threw the person out of the church, they got right with God. So even the result's better. Even the result is better. Because if, if someone stays here, you know what happens is they, that little leaven leaven at the whole lump. And that sin can spread you know, throughout the church, right? So it's so serious that God says if someone is living in fornication, kick them out of the church. Kick them out of the church. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. <clears throat> Now, obviously, if someone's a new believer, a new Christian, you give them time to grow. You get them, give them time to get these things right with God. But once down the road, they're confronted with it. You talk to them about it. They know it. And they're not going to get right with God. Well, you're going to have to be thrown out of the church. You're not going to be allowed to come here. Right. That's what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> you know, we're a new church. We're a small church, and we're trying to grow. But we're not going to sidestep the rules. We're not going to negate the rules of God in order to grow the church. That's not going to happen. You know, we're going to follow by the Bible. We're going to, you know, build our church upon the rock of God's word and then God will bless the church. God will bless the church. <clears throat> we're not trusting in man to build the church in the first place. We're trusting in God to build the church. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to see here how serious this was as well. It says in verse um, 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and then it says, and rose up to play. Now it doesn't tell you exactly what that means in the Old Testament. He's quoting to you from the New Testament. Now Paul's going to interpret it for you. Look at verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. This is the children of Israel. Now look at what it says next. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So I want you to notice here what took place because of this act of fornication directly from God. What does it mean that they fell in one day three and twenty thousand? It means that they died. It means they died. What did God do to these people because they were living in fornication? So it doesn't end at just, hey, get out of church. You're not allowed in our church. Do you know what God did? You know what you, you need to be more worried about if you're a child of God? You know what you need to be concerned about? You need to be concerned about the hand of the Lord. Right. 
The arm of the Lord punishing you. That's what you need to be concerned about. You need to be concerned about there's an almighty creator that's in heaven that is, is righting wrongs, right? And he's punishing his children on a daily basis. And if you're his child and you want to go out and live in fornication, just remember he recorded the punishments of those that committed fornication in the Old Testament as an example unto you, my friend. So if you want to go out and commit fornication, you know what God can do to you? He can take your life like that. He can take your life any second. He who gave life can take it any second. What is it to him, right? He could just take it at any moment. He could snuff out your life any second. How important is your life to you? Well, if it's important, then I would suggest not to live in fornication. We, see the, we can see here the punishment from God and what God thinks about fornication in a couple of different angles. Number one, we see that he says, kick him out of church. Number two, we see that God will put someone to death or God will kill someone for living in fornication. Now... Uh, let me say this too because this ties in with what we looked at already and what we're going to look at in the beginning. Not in every case does God put people to death for fornication. Himself. I, I'm using put to death. But he, it's not, he's not uh, commissioning this through uh, the government. He's just killing them himself, right, personally, reaching out and killing them. There were other things involved. But still we see here as an example, hey, don't commit fornication like they did because 3 and 20,000 died when they committed fornication. So what's the warning? You want to commit fornication? You want to tell you a possibility of God's punishment on your life? Death. That's a possibility of God's punishment on your life. Right. You know, so we should fear God. You know, people, you know, a lot of people don't fear God because God, the, the, you know, the punishments and the, the strength of God and the personality of the God of the Bible, it has been uh, lessened. It's been quieted, right? It's been watered down so much today. People don't want to preach about these things because they think they're going to offend people. And they think that they won't build their church like I was talking about before. That's the same reason why they wouldn't throw people out. But it's, it's in the Bible for a reason. Right. It's in the Bible for your benefit. It's in the Bible. You know what it's in the Bible for? So that you'll fear God. That's why. Amen. So that you'll have a, a healthy fear for God. I don't think fear is a good thing. You know why you stop at those red lights up there? Instead of just driving through? You know why? Because you're afraid that if you run that red light, you're going to get smashed by another car. That's why you do that. Fear in the right circumstances is a good thing. And who, you know, the most important thing that you should fear really is God. Amen. The one who gave you your life and your ability to walk around and everything that you have today in the first place, he said, commit fornication and I'll take your life from you. That's a possibility, my friend. He, the same person that gave you your life, said, I'll take it away. Live in fornication. Live in filth. Live a sinful life in lasciviousness. You know, and, and just maybe, maybe a woman even being a whore. You know what God says? I'll take your life away from you for that. Right. Now, whether or not you feel like fornication is wrong or not, or whether you've been numbed by the world, you know what you need to do is, this is the Bible talks about the washing of water by the Word. You need to wash that filth off your mind. It's because you're so desensitized to it. That's what it is. It's because you've been around it so much, and you've heard about it so much, and it's taking place on TV all the time, like it's not a big deal, and it's glorified. They would act like these two people love each other. Half the time, they don't love each other at all. Half the time, they don't care for each other at all. God says he'll kill you for it. That's what God says. Let that set in. Let's see the seriousness of fornication. And set the fear in the hearts of all these children of going out and living the fornication, fornicating lifestyle. Right. It's, a, it's a life of filth and disgustingness in the first place. Right. You go out there and you get diseases. It's disgusting. It's filthy. Amen. You know what the woman looks like when she says, Hey, I was a, I'm a virgin. And then you find out that she's not. You know what she looks like? How do you look at a, a woman like that? You look at her like a whore, don't you? Same thing for a man. How does he look? He looks, he looks disgusting. That's what he looks like. Have some self-dignity. People nowadays don't have any dignity for them. They don't respect themselves at all. They'll just give themselves to anybody without being married, without anything. It means nothing to them. You know why? Because you don't mean anything to yourself even. You have no dignity. Really? Even the Bible says in Ephesians 5, just doesn't a man love his own body? Not a person that goes around just, just sleeping with anybody. They're willing to pick up any disease, you know, have children with anybody. It's disgusting and it's filthy. Right. And I don't care if people aren't saying it and this sounds you know, crazy to you or not. 
it's filthy and it's disgusting. That's the lifestyle of fornication. That's what it is. <clears throat> Go back to Genesis chapter number 34. Genesis chapter number 34. So why were the sons of Jacob so grieved? Because it's filthy. Because it's terrible. It's terrible news to find out your, your uh, sister has committed fornication. It's terrible. <clears throat> It should make you angry. That's a righteous anger. The Bible talks you know, about a righteous anger. It should make you angry. You know, when uh, you, someone that you love, a, a woman or, or maybe a, a daughter, whoever this, this uh, female may be, even a male, right, that has uh, uh, participated in this act, it should grieve you because it's a big deal. Because it's a big deal. Even when someone gets married. I mean, the truth is... When, you're, when you get married and you are going to live with this person forever, you know, no one likes the idea of thinking about that your wife or your husband has been with multiple partners. You think you'd like that idea, thinking about that? No. Don't be a fool. No one likes thinking about that. When you are marrying someone, you're saying, we're going to stay together forever, right? We're going to be together forever. You know what you have? You know what? I mean, it's just, hey, and you know what? Sometimes sin just doesn't go away, Right? You know, people want to live in a fairy tale world today that just like thinks that everything can just be wiped away. Hey, Jesus can take away all your sins. You can go to heaven, be given righteousness. You can never lose your salvation. But here's the thing. The Bible talks about how some men's sins are open beforehand and some men's sins follow after. You know, some sins never go away as far as they can haunt you for the rest of your life. Bad decisions you make can haunt you for the rest of your stinking life. Right. You know, and one of them is committing fornication as a young teenager. You know, you know, obviously the best thing would be is knowing that your wife or your husband has never been with anyone else ever. It's only you. She kept herself for you. Wouldn't that be a much better idea? Amen. Isn't that what, if, if, if that's not what you have done and that's not where you're at in your life, you know what you need to do? You need to make sure that your children do that then. Amen. You need to instill this into your kids. Instill, it, instill this into your children. What do you think? You know, uh, if this is natural and normal and this is the lifestyle that people should be li uh, living, why are they picking up all of these diseases that will kill them? All these diseases that just, you know, uh, that, that, that cause you to, you know, I don't want to put anything graphic in your mind, but, you know, can cause members of your body to rot and just all different types of disgusting filthiness. Yeah, it's a, it's a natural, normal, you know, that's the consequence of living that kind of lifestyle. Now, you may not be aware of that, but that, these are scientific facts, my friend. So that's, that's, that can be a punishment of that as well. These are built-in punishments with sin. These are things that will never go away. Hey, go out there and live fornication. Hey, some of, the, some of the STDs go away. Some of them don't. Some of them will haunt you for the rest of your life. AIDS and HIV will be there forever, buddy. Never going away. Ever. Think about that. Never. There's all different types of, of, of celebrities you know, that have picked this, these types of things up. People that you can think of and put it in your mind. You know, Magic Johnson, for example, right? I, I was big into basketball as a kid and, and still watch every once in a while now. And Ma I remember, you know, when I found out that Magic Johnson had AIDS. You know what I think about every time I see that guy's face? You're filled with, with a disgusting disease. HIV? Are you kidding me? You, got, nobody, you think anybody wants to touch that guy now? Think about that. Nobody wants to be, imagine that. Would you want to be around him? Go shake his hand. Not a chance. You know what happens if, you know, because it's obviously, uh, um, uh, what's the word? From one person to another, what's the word? Transmit. No, not transmit wasn't what I was looking for, but that'll work. Uh, it wasn't contagious either. But yeah, it can transmit from one person to another through blood, right? I mean, imagine that guy's hand starts bleeding. What are you going to do? Hey, buddy, how you doing? No, you're staying away from that dude. I'm not getting near him. That's disgusting. Amen. Through bodily fluid, right? Anything. Spit, anything like that. You know what, you know what he is? What, why won't you touch him? Because he's filthy. That's why. How do you get that way? This is a disgusting lifestyle. Yeah, it, it, you know, he, ha he has these filthy diseases in him because he was living a filthy lifestyle. Right. It's the recompense of his reward. It's what he deserved, my friend. Right. You know, hey, I understand people do things in their past and they make mistakes, but like I said, that's my, my whole point is the, some sins follow after. Right. Some sins never go away. Some sins will haunt you. I'm not talking about salvation, so don't misunderstand me. Jesus can wipe your record away as far as your book being in the, and your, your, your name being in the book of life. 
you're going to heaven, you're saved. Even if you did filthy, you know, acts like that, God will punish you while you're on this earth. Right? But you're still going to go to heaven. But also, these, these, these types of things, if you live in this lifestyle, while God's punishing you, you can all, He can also get, cause you to pick up some of these diseases as a punishment while you're on this earth. Yeah, you'll die and go to heaven, but you can still ruin your life here. Look at Genesis chapter number 34 again. Look at verse number uh, 8. It says, And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. And I pray, I pray you, give her him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein. So they're saying through this, through this marriage, through this union between my son and your daughter, we can develop this relationship between our, basically our nations, if you will, or our, our tribes, whatever you want to refer to it as, right? Because uh, Israel or Jacob... At this time, he just has his 11 sons. He has a great amount of possessions and wealth, but he's not necessarily an entire nation, obviously, yet. But he has all of these possessions, so it's, of course, um, it's, of course um, um, uh, it'd be a, a, advan advantageous to him in order to make this, these dealings with him, right? Look at verse 11. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes. So now Shechem spoke up, right? And notice how, he, notice how he talks again. Remember what I talked about last chapter? He said, let me find grace in your eyes. Why, would he, why did he say grace? Of course, grace is something that, you, that, that someone needs when they've done something wrong, right? When they're in a position of being lower than someone else. Why? So what is he, he, he understands this is not right, how this went about. So he's saying, let me find grace in your eyes. He says, and, and he says, and what you shall say unto me, I will give. So what does he know? He knows... I need to give you something. In order to marry your daughter and what has taken place right now, you know, I'm going to need to give you something at this point uh, for the marriage. We need to go through with this. That's basically what's going on, right? Him coming out and admitting the fornication and everything, that's what's going on. Verse 12, ask me never so much dowry and gift. Dowry is like a payment at the marriage. Uh, you know, people will do this sometimes still. Uh, you know, Brother Garrett is like, uh, is really the only like modern example that's like a serious dowry, right? What was it, like four or five? Do anybody remember? Was it more than that? A bunch of cattle, man. It was a bunch of cattle, man. Yeah, so Garrett obviously married Nao, and they're in, uh, in Botswana right now, who's from Africa, and they are all, they're Christians, the, them in, in uh, Botswana. And uh, they still require a dowry. You know, the men in Africa, the, the, you know, uh, uh, Nao's father required a dowry to Garrett. If you want to marry my daughter, you're going to have to pay me this. And, and it was like, uh, they were going to get married much earlier, and then he found out it was like five cows or something, six cows. So he had to work that off for a little while because, you know, it can be kind of expensive, right? So he had to save up and everything, and then, of course, now they're married. But that, that was a real uh, example that I could personally experience of someone, you know, uh, having to pay a dowry. You know why people pay dowries is because <coughs> it was important to have, you know, this is the point. What, what do you pay money for? Something that has what? It has value, right? So when you're paying money for this woman, people think, oh, it's because, what, is she like a slave or something like that? No, it's because she has value. Right. It's because she has value, right? You know, uh, if, it's, if a woman's like sleeping around, she's being a whore her whole life, and then it's time to, you know, to, to, to go ahead and give her all over, is she going to have as much value? I mean, it's just the truth. She's not, is she? She's not going to have as much value. So if the woman has kept her purity, the same goes for the man, too. If a woman has kept her purity, in the man's eyes, she's going to be worth more, isn't she? She's going to have more value. So he'd be willing to pay more for her. Look at, uh, look at the rest of the verse. It says, And I will give according as ye, as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. So notice, <coughs> excuse me. He said, Notice he said, Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me. He's saying, anything you ask, I'll pay. Because remember, it's repeating over and over. He's saying, he, he loves her, he loves her, he loves her, right? Now, this is actually the same practice that God puts into place when it comes to fornication. Remember, the situation before was a little bit different. Because it was the daughter lying about her, her purity. It was lying about her virginity. And then going in and being with the man when she actually wasn't a virgin... And then she went ahead and committed the act. The man finds out she lied to me. 
You know, she lied to me, goes and tells the father, and then if the woman did lie, they put her to death in that situation. Well, that's not the punishment for just fornication. That's the punishment for a daughter that's being a whore and lying to her, to her father and then going through with the marriage. That's a major lie, man. Go to Deuteronomy 22 again. So in that same chapter we were in before, Deuteronomy chapter number 22, right after that we see uh, <clears throat> what the punishment for fornication is. And it's, it's actually the same exact scenario that was playing out there in Genesis 34. It's the exact same uh, uh, situation that we were seeing there in Genesis, <clears throat> Genesis number 34. So look there in verse number... Verse number... Uh, whoops, I'm in the wrong chapter. I was wondering well, that didn't look right. Look at verse 28. It says this, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin... Now, what was, uh, what was the words that were used in talking about? Uh, speaking of uh, Dinah. Damsel, maid, right? It used both those, damsel and maid. So it says, if a, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed... That means she's like not engaged. That's basically the word we use right today. And lay hold on her... And lie with her. And then it says, and they be found. So is this consensual? Yeah, it says, and they be found. Both of them are guilty. That means they're both being discovered or caught. That's what that means, found. They're both uh, 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 discovered and, and guilty here. It says, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver. And she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. She may not put her away all his days. Now... I want you to notice what takes place is if a man, if a man and a woman <coughs> were to go out and commit fornication together and then they were caught, what's the punishment? They, get married. They, have, they are forced to get married. They are forced to get married, number one. Number two, the man who is guilty has to pay what? 50 shekels of silver to the father. Now, number one, that shows us a big deal again, taking his daughter's purity, Right? And then number two, we see, we see that it says that they must get married. Why? Because it's important. It's, even at this point, it's important to maintain your purity. So if, even if you have made a mistake like this, you know what you should do personally? If you have a child with a, with a woman or, you have, or have committed fornication with a woman, you should marry her. Because what would be worse? Now, I'm not talking about if you're already married. Obviously, that's a totally different scenario. I'm talking about fornication. What would be worse is if you did commit that act, and let's say maybe you did pick up an STD, and then you went and, mar and then married some other woman. What if you had a child with that woman, and then went and married some other woman? Is that practical? God's law is not only right and wrong. God's law is designed for practicality for your life. That's why people that follow God's law, they live a happy life, right? So it's meant to help you to be happy. And it's not okay just to go out and sleep with somebody and then move on to the next person. No, you need to be held to, to, you know, to your actions. You know what you should do? You should marry that woman is what you should do. Because that's an act that should only go on between two married people. Now you have to marry her. If you want to go out and do this, now you're getting married. So they would be forced to be married under you know, the, the old Israelite law, according to the Bible, right? Notice that it was 50 shekels of silver. What was the other one? A hundred. It was a hundred shekels of silver, right? A hundred shekels of silver. So it was 50 different. 50 different. Why? Because in this type of case, this, can be, this doesn't have to be publicized. This doesn't have to be publicized. Ever. Everybody doesn't have to find out that, that your daughter had committed fornication, does she? The other situation, this guy's going around and he's false accusing her of such a thing. So he, the guy would have been lying and saying she's, she's a whore. So that's why it's a bigger deal in the other situation and that's why also she was put to death. So what's a, a bigger sin? Obviously, the situation where she lied and she committed adultery. So notice further the difference. I want to point out, I'm going to prove to you real quick that, that this was fornication, in fact, that uh, Dinah and Shechem committed. I want you to look at the same language that's used here. Number one, we have the exact same scenario. That's probably the first thing that I should point out. The exact same scenario. They committed fornication, and then what does Shechem say? Hey, I'm going to marry her. And what dowry do you want? What happens if somebody commits fornication? They need to get married, and then they need to what? Pay a dowry, right? They need to pay. That's what the 50 shekels of silver would be, basically. It would be the gift or the dowry. Not only that, the language that's used in verse number 28, it says, and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found. Go back to Genesis chapter 34. 
Same type of language it says verse in 34 2. It says, He saw her, he took her, and lay with her. Right? Further proof of this is verse 6. <clears throat> if you look down at verse 6, it says this. And they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel. And it says, in lying with Jacob's daughter. Now, what, type, what does that imply? Does it, it, does it sound like he raped her? Because that's the other scenario. Does that sound like he raped her? No, it says he wrought folly in Israel because he lied with her. Now, that phrase is used throughout the Bible. And what is it referring to? When someone lies with someone, it's not rape. It's fornication or going to bed, right? They lied together. That's what that's saying. <clears throat> go, uh, go over to Genesis chapter 34, where we were before, in verse number uh, 13. <clears throat> also, you know what? Compare here. Let's look real quick. Uh, I want to look at verse number 31. Also, I want to look at verse number 31 in light of what we just read before we move too far ahead. It says this in the same chapter, verse 31. It says, And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? So notice what they would say that, and they, that they're saying that, his, that how he was treating um, uh, his, their sister. How? Like what? Like a harlot, right? Or like what? Like a whore. Now, is, is the relationship between a harlot, what's a harlot? A real harlot. I'm not just saying a woman that's acting like a harlot. A real harlot or a real whore. They mean the same thing. What's a whore? It's a prostitute. Is that a consensual relationship when someone deals with a prostitute? Of course. So he's saying he's dealing with our sister as a what? As like a prostitute. Saying, what, what do you do with a prostitute? You just go and you sleep with her and then you leave. So what are they implying? Like, he can just go and sleep with our sister and then just leave, right? That's why it says lying with Jacob's daughter, because they lied together, right? Not only that, it says that in verse 34, you can see his attitude towards her. Verse 3, it says, And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. So what's the type of, uh, pers uh, what's the type of uh, perception that he has of, of Dinah? It says he loved her, but not only that, it says he spake kindly unto the damsel. So, this is the Holy Spirit telling you his attitude towards her, and how is he treating her? How does it sound like he's treating her? He well, he loves her, right? He's speaking kindly unto her. So, the picture that's being painted is that they committed fornication. That's the picture that's being, being painted. Go back over to Genesis chapter number 34. Look at, uh, <clears throat> look at verse number uh, 14, or verse number 13. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem... And Hamor, his father, deceitfully and said, and this is why they did this, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. So they lied to him and they said this. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us, saying that would be embarrassing or be something shameful if our sister was given unto a man that was uncircumcised. So that proves, number one, that they didn't care whether she really... In, in, in sincerity, they didn't care whether she married someone that was uncircumcised or not. In the, saying that they're saying this deceitfully. You understand what I'm saying? So that proves they did, it didn't matter to them. <clears throat> Verse number 15. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughters unto you, <clears throat> and we will take your daughters to us. Saying we'll start having marriages amongst each other, Right? And we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not. That means he didn't wait. He deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. And he was more honorable than all the house of of his father. Now that kind of gives you an idea into his integrity at least. Now his, it's saying that he's more honorable than all of his house but we don't know how much honor his house had and uh, how much honor his father had even. But the, obviously still the Holy Spirit's telling you that for a reason. There's a reason why it says hey he deferred not to do this yeah, for he had more honor. He was more honorable than all of his house, right? What is it? How is it worded? Where is it at? What verse? Somebody pointed out to me? 19. 19. He was more honorable, yeah, that is, than all of the house of his father. That's what I was confused about. All of the house of his father. So notice he's more honorable than all of them. So it's still trying to tell you he had somewhat of integrity. That's obviously the point of why the Holy Spirit included that verse in there. He, he had somewhat of integrity saying that if he says he's going to do something, what? He's going to do it. That's why it says he deferred not to do it. So he's somewhat at least of a faithful man, in, in, in ways at least. Verse 20. <clears throat> 
And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came, in, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives and let us give them our daughters. So trying to coerce everyone in order to go through with this. I mean, that'd be a, that'd be a tall order, man. You gotta walk into an entire city and, and, cons and, and convince all the men to circumcise themselves. If you understand what's entailed in circumcision, these are grown men that were uncircumcised, they're just by birth, and they're like, hey, I got it, we got a great deal, guys. There's these people, they got a lot of wealth. They got all these possessions. It's going to be, you know, we're going to grow in our prosperity and we, I mean, it's going to be great. But there's one catch. Here's a knife. You're going to have to go. I mean, circumcision is a major operation. I mean, it is a procedure, right? It would be extremely painful. That's a big, you know, uh, decision to make. And they had to go in there and convince all of these guys. That's what I think about every single time I, I read this. Same thing when it talks about Abraham, how he circumcised himself and all of his house. I mean, that's a lot of that's a big deal, man. All the city. Look what it says next, verse 22. Only hear him will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people if every male, male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Now obviously we've got to keep in mind that he was a prince. So he had political poor influence in some way too. <clears throat> verse 23. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them and they will dwell with us. So he's, all, he's, he's also trying to, like I said, coerce them through you know, uh, the possibility of financial prosperity through this decision. Verse 24. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city. And every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. Now I want you to pay attention to this. This is why Simeon and Levi told him to circumcise themselves. Verse 25, it says, And it came to pass on the third day, so three days after they had circumcised themselves, when they were sore, saying when they were still in pain, they're still recovering from this, <clears throat> that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew, that means killed, all the males. So that's all the men that had just circumcised themselves. Now, of course, it's obvious why they came on the third day. Like I said, it was when they were still in pain. They're still in, in, in uh, they're still recovering, right? <clears throat> Verse 26, it says, And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house. And then it says, and went out. So then they left. So Simeon and Levi are the ones that obviously went in, and they killed every man. They're just going from like house to house or tent to tent with a sword and they're just going in while these guys are probably laying down in like major pain still. They can't get up. They're not prepared for this. And they just come in with a sword just, just killing one person after the next, after the next, after the next. That's, I mean, that's pretty great. This is a city, my friend. So they're killing, you know, probably over a hundred people, hundreds of people. They're just going from house to house to house, you know, just one after the next, after the next. Probably uh, crafty in some way so that people don't hear it. And don't, you know, it's not that they can't do much. I mean, it's a major procedure. You know, that's major. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't be able to move around, really. So they're not able to defend themselves. So this is, of course, uh, extremely deceitful. Then it says in verse 27, The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. Now, spoiled the city means they came. You, know, you, know, you probably heard like pirates talk about booty, right? That's what spoil is. It's they're going in and they're taking all of their stuff. After they kill them, oftentimes when one army defeats the other army and they're dead, they'll go in and they'll take all their things and all their possessions for themselves. That's spoiled. It's just like uh, extra or bonus that they've now gotten, right? <clears throat> then it says, and it tells you at the end why? Because they had defiled their sister. Now, how did they see the act that, that had taken place? They saw it at, obviously, now let me say this before we go any further. What they did was super wicked. What they did was super wicked and evil. I mean, it was even more wicked than what Dinah and Shechem had done, right? And they obviously were extremely angry and then went in there and just killed everybody. Now, that's not right either. So that doesn't mean that you get you, you, you have a righteous anger. You obviously need to control that, right? It, and it needs to not become an unrighteous anger where you want to kill somebody for something that they don't deserve, you know, the punishment of death. Now, for fornication in this type of situation, did Shechem and did uh, Dinah deserve to die? No. 
Neither one of them did not. Neither one of them deserved to die. Lights just flicker was at my eyes. Yeah, you, know, you blink sometimes. They did flicker. Yeah. Uh, no, they, of course they did not deserve to die. And then not only did he go in there and kill Shechem, he killed everyone else in the entire city. Did they have anything to do with that? No. Totally and one hundred percent innocent. Completely innocent and had nothing to do with that. Now, you may or may not, you know, uh, uh, you might not agree with me, and I don't care about that, number one. That wasn't what I was getting ready to say. But, uh, but number two, you may or may not see this parallel, but when I read stories like this, when a bunch of innocent people die, when people, I mean, what in the world? When some, it's, you know, can you imagine going in there, and then he kills Shechem, he kills Hamor, and then he just moves on to the next random tent and just kills a random person, and then just goes to the next tent and kills another random person. Did they, they had nothing to do with that. How wicked and evil is that? Super evil. Right. Super wicked. Do you know what it makes me think about? It makes me think about all these wars that America fights. Right. That's what it makes me th think about. It makes me think about our military going to all these countries. Now, I believe it's a boogeyman in the first place. I believe that, they, that, that, these, that these wars are staged for our empire, and that's what the United States of America is. It's an empire that's trying to take over the whole world. And we're not any different than any other empire that's ever existed on this planet. We are greedy of gain, and that's why all these wars are fought. But let me say this. Even if there are terrorists in some countries, do you know what happens? These types of situations take place where tons of innocent people, tons of innocent people die that had nothing to do with maybe some act that took place. Maybe someone, maybe some terrorist is fighting against, you know, you're in their country in the first place. Right. You went into their, can you imagine somebody coming in and, and, and setting up shop in your backyard and then you try to defend yourself and then it's all over the media about these wicked, you know, terrorists and stuff. You're on their property, my friend. You're on their land. That's not your property. That's not your land. Right. You don't have any right to be there. Can you imagine just anybody, the United States of America, just choosing some country just to invade and setting up a base there? It's wicked. Right. Stop telling me they're defending m my freedom. They're not defending Jack for me, buddy. Right. I'm as free as can be here. There's no invading army in this country. We're not fighting on this soil. Right. You, went over to you, know, you went over to another land, another province. It has nothing to do with me. It's not defend. If that war ended it ended today, do you think my freedom? I'm just gonna have my freedom's gonna be lost tomorrow. I'm gonna be in chains tomorrow. You're an idiot. Right. They're not defending freedom. They're fighting for a machine that's taking over the entire world. What is it like? 164 bases set up over the world? It's something like that. The United States of America has has bases in like 164 countries. Let that set in. That's like the the, the stinking Roman Empire. It's like the Greek Empire. More powerful. Far more powerful. You know, not just because of our technology. We're larger because more of the world's inhabited today as well. It's an empire. And you know the world, wars that are being fought? You know what's happening? Yeah, let's, I'll give you here and there maybe somebody does something wrong. But I don't believe that in the first place. They shouldn't be in their country. But not only that, let's say that they did. Do you know how many innocent men and women and children have died in these wars? Right. Thousands upon thousands, if not millions, over the years in, in all of the war, wars that have been fought unrighteously. It's no different than Simeon and Levi going you know, tent to tent, house to house. People that had nothing to do with that fornication. They had nothing to do with that wickedness. That was between two people. And they just walk into somebody else's house while they're sitting there with their family. They're sitting there with their children and they take their life. It's no different than these stinking wars that are fought today. Unrighteous, unjust wars that are fought for greedy gain. Right. All these Americans need to wake up. Amen. They need to figure out your country's not as special as you think it is in every way. Hey, there might be some privileges in this country, but as far as our morality, we're as wicked as hell. Right. The, the wars that are fought by the United States of America are unjust. And people, innocent people, are dying every day. Stop caring only about the people that live in this country. Start caring. Hey, I understand Muslims and all these people as part of these, these other false religions, Islam, they're dying and they're going to hell, but I still want them to be saved just as much as I want Bob down the street to be saved. Amen. Shouldn't just all the, you know, these Arabs just nuke them. You're wicked, buddy. You're wicked as hell. 
All these innocent children, these innocent women, they don't deserve that. Just like Simeon and Levi. It's wicked. It's super wicked. Turn to Genesis 49. Look at this. Turn to Genesis 49. This brought <clears throat> a curse down upon many generations afterwards because of this act. Look at Genesis chapter number 49. This is the blessing that Jacob ultimately passes down to <coughs> each of his sons. <coughs> it says in Genesis 49.1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Now he's going to prophesy to them. Obviously, this is uh, from the Lord. He's getting ready to prophesy to them something that's going to happen many days later. And he gives out the blessings at this time too. Look at verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are, are in their habitations. Notice what he says. Instruments of cruelty. Saying it's cruel. Now God is described as being cruel as well, but God's cruelty is just. When God is cruel and punishing people, it's what they deserve. So notice what it says next. So instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor... Be not the, thou united. What is he saying? He's, he's making like a division. He's prophesying about like saying we should stay away from them, right? Then he says this, For in their anger they slew a man. And watch this next. And in their self-will they digged down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. And their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Notice this ended up being a punishment. Now Levi, of course, because of the priest, right? But Simeon was also scattered about because of where he was located. So this ended up being a punishment to their generations afterwards. And what was the problem? It was because of their anger. That's why. Now the Bible's not just against anger. And they say, oh, you were angry just a minute ago. You know, Jesus was angry. He went into the temple and flipped over you know, uh, all of the, the tables and the money changers. He made a whip and drove people out. He was mad. The Bible talks about Jesus being angry. This is talking about unrighteous anger. Anger that is raw, the wrong kind of anger. Right? right? Now, you can be angry about the right things, but then it, it, it can also be misguided. And that's what happened here. I would be angry if, I don't have a sister, but if my sister committed fornication and she you know, slept with some guy. I would be mad. Right? Now, let me say this too. Notice that... He, uh, Simeon and Levi, I forgot to point this out, went in there, killed everybody, but then delivered their sister. It's like, what, I mean, what you're doing to those guys, they don't deserve that either, but then sh you just deliver her. I understand you love her, but you know what's going on here? Respecter of persons is what's going on here. So you can see unrighteous judgment there as well. So they deliver her, right? So that obviously, you know, what, it, they should have been killing everybody anyways, but you can see their attitude obviously isn't right. It's not about just getting, you know, righting the wrong here. It's they're angry because now there's going to be a bad reputation and because now also they defiled their sister and they love their sister. Now, so you, we need to have righteous anger about the right things, but then we also need to make sure that we're not misguided in the way that we act. So you need to be, able to, you need to be a man that can control himself. You need to be someone that... If you get mad about the right things, you don't just fly off the handle. You don't make all kinds of spontaneous, stupid de decisions, right? You need to be a person that can, you know, they can still remain, you know, uh, cool, calm, and collected. Even when you're mad, even when you're angry, you're still thinking and making good decisions, right? As opposed to what they did here. It says, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Now, I want you to notice it said, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. So, or, I'm sorry, it was actually the end of verse 6. This is why I want you to notice. It says, And in their self-will they dig down a wall. What does it mean, self-will? It was their own will. Saying that this, what is the implication here? You conjured something up, up in your own heart and it wasn't right. Saying what? That, that they didn't deserve to die. That's the whole point. Notice also it says this, For in their anger they slew a man. Now, how many people did they kill? A lot of people. But who do you think it's talking about when it says they slew a man? Shechem. What well, do you know what that further proves? That he didn't deserve to die. If somebody In the Bible, you know what the punishment for rape is? Death. So if they slew this man and he's saying it's wrong that you killed him, did he rape her? No. 
So th the punishment is, of course, right? They're specifically pointing out that the fact of their unrighteous punishment upon him. It says you slew, they slew a man. It's, of course, talking about Shechem. It's saying they slew a man and he didn't deserve it. That's what they're pointing out. Because right after he says self-will. So it's talking about you conjured and you know, devised this up in your mind and you killed this guy out of your own will when it was unrighteous. He shouldn't have died. Why? Because the punishment for fornication is not death. And what they did was they lost control. Go back to Genesis chapter number 34. We're going to end real quick. We went a little bit longer for Bible study than we usually do. Obviously, there's a lot to learn about the, the, uh, the punishments and the consequences of fornication here, of course. It says in verse number uh, <coughs> 27, The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. Verse 28, They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me. And I shall be destroyed, I and my house. I'm going to read to you from a couple of passages real quick in the book of Proverbs. Uh, you can turn over here with me if you'd like. Just keep your hand there. We're going to read these. We're going to be done here in like less than five minutes. Proverbs chapter number 15. Proverbs chapter number 15. We're going to look at verse number 20 about him saying, You caused me to stink among the inhabitants. He said, You troubled me and make me to stink among the inhabitants. Proverbs 15, 20. He's talking about his reputation. You know, not, you know it, was, it was bad enough that his daughter had committed fornication. We saw that that was shameful among the people. But furthermore, obviously it's much worse when your sons just lose control and they go in and they kill all that dwell in an entire city. I mean, obviously that's extremely wicked, isn't it? Now, and then, of course, all the people round about are thinking, these people are a loose cannon. You know, they, they have no honor. They're, they're not righteous. They're just going out and just killing anybody saying, you know, they're going to think that I might be a threat and come and try to kill me. That's what he says. The importance of having a good reputation. Look at, uh, look at uh, Proverbs 15, 20 and what your sons can do for your reputation. It says this, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. I want you to also look over at Proverbs chapter number 17, verse number 25. I have a couple of these down. Proverbs chapter number 17, verse number 25. It says, A foolish son is a grief to his father, and bitterness to her that bear him. Notice, uh, speaking about a foolish son, or a, 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 a poor, uh, uh, not well-behaved son, what is it? It's a grief to his father. What was Simeon and Levi? To Jacob. It was a grief to him. I mean, that's not a small... Sometimes we read about this, we don't put ourselves in their situation of what took place. He just killed an entire city. They come back with all these possessions. Everybody's going to hear about this and everybody's going to know what took place. You know what it caused? It caused grief to his mind. That's what it did. Go back to Genesis chapter uh, 34. Genesis chapter 34. I'm going to read to you about the importance of reputation. Here it is from Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1. Dead flies caused the, the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. A stinking savor, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. This still applies because the son is reflecting the father in this type of situation, isn't it? And what is it doing? It's causing his reputation to stink. It's causing him to stink among the inhabitants. So you know what you can see here is that your children, it's important how your children behave. They reflect you. That's why the Bible, one of the commandments to a man that wants to be, or one of the qualifications to a man that wants to be a pastor, is that you have to rule your own house well. Is Jacob ruling his own house well here? Not in this situation, that's for sure. Not in this situation. You know, see, it's a shame, isn't it? You need to have, but you need to have raised your children better. We look at the Bible like, oh, it's Jacob. He's the, you know, he's the the, the leader of the nation of Israel. He's the greatest man that ever lived. They're sinners and they make mistakes and they have bad uh, character flaws, just like you do. Just like Eli, who's the priest of of God, his children were terrible. Both of his sons, Hophni and Phineas, were terrible, weren't they? So, you know, you could see this even with uh, Aaron's sons that go in and offer the, 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 uh, the, the uh, offering when they're not supposed to, right? Nadab and Abihu. It's, I mean, it's obviously a reflection upon him. His son's getting out of line. You know, he's worried about his reputation and it's going to be a cause of, of a bad reputation upon all of the whole nation. Now, what do we see here? Let's finish and read the last verse. Go in there. It says in verse 31, And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? 
So we see that this is a big deal, isn't it? You know what you see here is you see the consequ consequences of fornication. I mean, all of this started with what? She, Dinah just wanted to go out and see the daughters of the land. That's all, that, that was the beginning of it. She went out and she saw the daughters of the land. A man saw her, took her. He lied with her. A whole city's murdered. I mean, you see the grief that it's causing Jacob. You see the, the contention between the brethren, the curse that's given to Simeon and Levi. Dinah has to live with this forever. She witnessed this man that became her husband, killed, that she committed this act with. This is the consequences of fornication. There are many others that I mentioned already, but you never know the problems that it's going to cause. With the, the, the father, maybe of the daughter, with whatever. You know, you, know, you have no idea. Right. You have no idea. You know, so... You know what you need to do if you got daughters? You need to protect them. Amen. You know what you need to do if you have sons? You need to raise them right. Amen. You need to raise them right and teach them the wickedness of fornication and teach them the consequences of, you know what, you, you know, if you, you hear the, all the punishments and the warning and you don't take heed to it, you know, no skin off my nose, buddy. You're not taking any skin off my back. You're just going to go, you're going to go ruin your own life, not mine. That's for sure. You know, you're the one not taking heed to God's word. I hope that you do that which is right. So we need to follow God's law, not only to take heed to the punishments, but we need to do so because we love God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We should also fo follow God's law because we love Him. And of course, you know, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, uh, provocative to, to uh, maybe provocative is not the right word, especially in the context of the sermon, but it's definitely, uh, it doesn't, it's influential the fact that you can be punished so severely as being put to death. The, con the consequences of fornication can be very severe. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the warning. We thank you, dear God, for your word. We ask you that you help us as a church to stand on it, even when it's not popular in the world, to warn people. Dear God, we thank you for the, the examples, even the foolish examples of, of Jacob as a father in many ways, dear Lord. Um, also, of, of course, we know that he wanted to do that, which is right, just made bad decisions, dear God. We ask you that you would help us not to make those same decisions, help us not to be self-righteous and think that, you know, uh, that, that we're right about everything, dear Lord. Help us to, to uh, try to fix our flaws in, in all of our areas, wherever we may be wrong ourselves. Help us to understand the seriousness of fornication, to preach it to our sons. Uh, help us to be good fathers and good leaders, and help us to stand up and protect uh, the women in our lives. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.